One win, one defeat for Reading FC in a week that did that awful thing we always hate, got our hopes up. A confident, composed performance of Bristol City secured a 2-0 win and a manager sacking before a 2-0 reverse, a home to Neil Warnock's middles, but jolted the hoped-for turnaround in the Royals' form. Welcome to episode 254 of the Tyler Stem Podcast, the Reading FC podcast by fans. For fans, I'm your host, Mark May, and joining me this week is Alan West. Westy, how's it going, mate? Yeah, mate, thank you. Yeah, I'm not too bad, thank you. Um, yeah, not too bad, despite despite the setback, um, which kind of you know kind of happened very quickly with the with the nature of the goals. But um, yeah, we're decent. Just before we go on to end the recap, um, thanks as always to our sponsors ZCZ Films and to our Patreon subscribers. Hopefully, um, doing that you know that little bit for the. Uh, you know the podcast and everything and um, you know hopefully with the uh, with the technology and everything that we make a pretty decent quality recording um, if any if there is any problems with this recording however it is uh, minor technical glitches that is happening with uh, with Westy For recording this we like to think that it's going to be good enough quality Westy on like a you'd say a, a, a 1980s style device <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so let's get into this then in the recap. Come rain or shine, it's time to relive the latest match action with the recap. This podcast is sponsored by ZCZ Films, Reading's oldest ultras. So, Bristol City, let's get into that first then, Westy. A lovely 2-0 win for the Royals off the back of um, the defeat on the weekend against Millwall. This seemed like actually... Uh, the turnaround that we all hoped for, and obviously, as it turned out, not the permanent turnaround, but for, you know, Reading, it, it was a pretty classic Lucas Schau goal, pretty trademark effort from him from the free kick, did well to hold off the defenders, then an unexpected worldie from Michael Morrison to make it 2 0. And, you know, Reading just kind of held on, did the professional job, Bristol City a bit of a shambles as we went there, and really just kind of did the business and got out of there. Yeah, it was encouraging after a couple of, uh, well, about an un. Unjustified to be against Brentford, I thought. I thought they were good for a draw there. But yeah, so we got back on track, which was nice. Um, the thing was that I was thought Reading was sort of in second gear in the game. I thought at any point they could have gone on to win by more. Um, they didn't really exert themselves too much and they didn't really have to, which was, was nice to see. Um, I think the only problem we've got now, really, is that is, if you look at the last four or five games, there's a home record is sort of going, going to pot again and uh, that probably might cost us in the long term if it carries on too long. Yeah, no, certainly. So I, I'm, I'm minded to, it's, it's hard to work out exactly, you know, as you say, home form and away form at the moment. It's kind of hard to work out without, without the fans. It is difficult for me to get a, to get a pure grip on, on how much that is affecting things at the moment. But certainly, you know, Bristol City with, they sacked the, you know, you know, it's a, it's a bad situation when they sack their manager after losing to Reading. I often joke that it's, it's the ideal embarrassment and humiliation to lose to Reading that you then lose. It's quite, ni- it's, it's quite nice that we did get a manager sacked, really, because it means we, we played well and they haven't, so that's one good thing. Um, but two good goals, like you said, I thought Jam's goal was excellent. Again, like you say, trademark, but the strength and the, the finish, great. One touch, it's in the back of the net. Um, and, and the second goal as well, like I said, who would have said that Morrison's going to go marauding down the pitch? Um, something he tried on Saturday as well, but yeah, he wasn't quite so lucky that time. But yeah, he's, he's been playing well, I think, all season, and he's been, he really has been a, a real steady eddy for us this year, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to be fair, I think you know, going into the season, there was a, maybe a few murmurs about Morrison in the sense that, you know, with more, he, he hit form pretty early on. We've got McIntyre and Gibson kind of, and, and Holmes as well, kind of nib- nibbling at their heels. So for, for Morrison to, to keep putting in these performances is really good. And I think for the, you know, for the Bristol City game as well, that Reading did keep plugging away, he almost made it 3 0 a couple of times, but. I think really we can't take for granted getting these results, even when teams are doing badly. Because if you compare ourselves to Brentford, Westy, when we played Brentford a couple of weeks ago and lost, we were saying, oh, they're going to be brilliant. They're the best team in the league. And they've lost three since then. And we both kind of had that that immediate wobble that you could maybe blame on tiredness. But we, you know, Reading managed to bounce back a little bit. Brentford have kept losing. So it just goes to show that these games, you know, being able to get in and out, Bit more of a ruthless um, performance is a it's a it's a sign that we are still a good team. Yeah, definitely, and it's, it's a bit of it's a thing we've missed over the years, isn't it? Going to struggling sides and, and not getting results has been sort of the forte of the last three or four seasons. 
Um, so, yeah, we have been quite clinical when we've played the teams that are, are struggling and we've, we've managed to kill them off. And if you look at the 10 games we've got coming up, you know, that continues because we need the points to be keep rolling. And it's a good opportunity now, if you look at the games, they've got to pick up quite a lot of points if they can find uh, anywhere near the sort of best. Yeah, well, let's um, let's talk about that Middlesbrough defeat then. 2-0 it was on the weekend. First half goals from Ashley Fletcher and Mark Bowler. Really, um, I mean, I, I, I think the, the one thing that I was thinking about this West, as you said about the home form, and Reading have lost seven games at home um, this season now, which only Wickham, Preston and Birmingham have lost more home games in the championship. And I was thinking, I don't know if you saw a few weeks ago when we played, or a couple weeks ago when we played Millwall, Gary Warrett saying afterwards that they were so unimpressed with our dressing room, like alternative that we gave them. I'm pretty sure they're getting dressed in the concourse of Y19 or something at the moment. And for them, they found that to be a bit of a motivation to, you know, do us do us over in effect, and obviously they managed to do that. Do you reckon that these are the sort of things that are playing? It's one of the elements that are maybe playing against us at the moment that teams are a bit more uncomfortable and that, you know, they're they're a bit more motivated as a response. Maybe uh, it's either that or we, we're very good. At, we've been better away from home. We, we have been for a number of seasons now, um, but I, I think maybe it's because. Teams uh, are coming down to Reading now and not not fearing us quite as much as they were maybe at the start of the season. They know we're going to play. Now exactly how we're going to set up. I mean, it's no surprise to see Reading's team line up. Is it very rarely? I think any position we don't know who's going to start in general is going to be right back. But other than that, you know what teams Reading really going to come out and now they're going to play against them. And you notice certainly as the season's gone on that they've, they've surrounded Joe and stopped him getting the ball quite as much as he, much freedom as he had at the start of the season. So they're cutting off that link and I think then you're really looking and again this was another game that was quite prevalent you can see it is you're really looking for your two wingers or your two wide players to make a, a big difference in the game and I think that's where we fell down uh, especially Saturday but in general the last few weeks I think Ajaria I mean he's coming for a lot of um, stick on Twitter that I see and it's someone that I've said for months about Ajaria that he tends to hold the ball for way way too long um, he needs to learn to give the ball and go and, and use his, his pace rather than his skill sometimes to to get in better positions than he does. I mean, I think one of the games, I mean, especially the Millwall game, is the bit where he went through on goal. All you really need to do is get the ball out from your feet and, and sort of drive towards goal. Um, but he didn't. He took two or three touches and before you know it, he had three players around him. I mean, it looks great when he takes them on and beats them. But I just think he really needs to learn quickly if he wants to be a top-class player. Uh, and play Premier League football. He needs to learn how to, when, and how to release that ball a lot quicker. Because sometimes he slows our attacks down when really we should be getting players forward quicker and, and driving on. Um, and Elise does it as well, quite a bit. Um, not quite as bad as uh, Jaria, because Elise will look for a killer ball, uh, whereas Jaria probably doesn't. Um, so he kind of gets away with it. And again, he's young and still learning the game. But both of them need to get the ball from out under their feet, give and go sometimes, and just get get moving a lot quicker and try and get forward faster than they do and I think that cost us against Middlesbrough because especially second half we really created nothing to get back into the game apart from the uh, shot Yida Mad that he probably should have with left foot um, but other than that we didn't really threaten them and I thought the substitutions were odd I don't know about you Matt but I thought it was some strange substitutions at half time yeah it, it's We've talked a lot about the, um, you know, the the problems with the squad, but even so, the the big idea at half time is to bring on a, a young Porto right back who's on loan, and you know, a, a young loney Everton left back is that's not going to change the world. It's not going to change the game, especially against the Warnock side. And you know that being two 0 down against the Warnock side, you know you're pretty much onto a hiding anyway at that point. You've, the game's kind of gone, so it does it does feel weird to me that. Uh, I wrote after in the Millwall game in the report for that that Poundovich doesn't know how to change the course of games, does he? And that doesn't that certainly tends to be a bit of a theme that has continued into this one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, Gibson, I don't know what he's going to offer you in going forward. I mean, I'm not saying he's a bad player, but he's just not going to get you back into the game, is he? Um, and Estevez, oh, you can see that maybe. I mean, I think Estevez has got ability. Um, again, he's another player that sort of divides opinion, I think. But I, I genuinely think that one day he would certainly, in the near future, go on to be a decent player. Um, another player learned his trade, and obviously he's learning it here. But you can see why he might have brought him on, because he does offer you a bit going forward. Um, but when you've got two strikers sat on the bench, I know one of them's not played that much, but you'd have thought, 
you'd have given them at least half hour to try and make a difference. Um, you could see it wasn't really working. You knew exactly what Mills were going to do second half. They're going to sit in, they're going to be big and awkward and strong and put the tackles in and stop you getting in behind them, which is what they've done. But to put them players on and take the players off they did, I don't see how that is going to make a massive difference in any game, not just this one. Um, I don't see what he's thinking was that. I really, really can't figure that one out. No, well, I mean, in terms of the goals themselves, then I felt like the first goal, you know, it's a free kick lofted in, they win the knockdown and they win the second ball. It kind of felt to me like, you know, Alpha Semedo, he lost, as I say, that first ball. Um, Tom McIntyre was never on his man, quite frankly, he was always a yard off him, and Ashley Fletcher yeah, tapped I at think home. Once Semedo, once missed, sorry, once Semedo missed the, missed the ball, which is what he done, he missed, read the flight to me, and never guy got the run on him. Um, and good fit to fair play to Mills, but like you say, you know what they're going to bring to you. It's been much, bit, much, bit the same really as you knew what Mill was going to bring a few mm. weeks before um, you know they're going to try that ball um, Reading got caught out and, and ultimately that cost them for the first goal I mean it was poor all round but I thought the second goal was poor as well it was a great strike from him but if you watch Elise he gets caught ball watching gets dragged towards the ball left his man and then he smashed it into the roof of the net and like you said we're, you're onto a hiding to nothing then because you've really got to go for the game and Reading didn't really go for the game I didn't think yeah, also, I mean, Josh Lawrence kind of lost out for the second goal as well. Vinamotta don't really know what he was doing at, at that moment. But the thing I'd say in terms of chasing the game, Westy, is that Reading had 63% of the possession overall in that game, and that went up over the second half. And that doesn't really favour us, counting, you know, even the games that we've had against the sort of, you know, the Coventrys at home and the Wickhams at home. I don't think we had a huge amount, of, or certainly not that much of the ball in those games. And whenever it comes to Reading being the dominant possession side, we do just struggle a little bit. I think the problem is that you've got is teams are happy to let you have the ball, especially when you're tuning it up. And if, if the ball's going sideways and backwards, it, it, that sort of possession is, is a waste of time, really, isn't it? Uh, when you're chasing a match, you really want to play more sort of pressure football, maybe take a few more risks than you normally would. Um, again, if you'd have, if you'd have stuck to up front a bit earlier, then you could have prob- you possibly had the sort of Flick on some jarring balls in behind. Um, that never really happened. And I think session football is great, but if it's not working, if you're going backwards or just keeping the ball for long periods of time, then what's, what's the point? Just to round off the recap, then I will point out that you know, Middlesbrough do have a bit of a bit of a run on us. Really, four in a row they've won at the Madstad. We've lost seven or last eight games against them. So. Yeah, it's, it's, there's actually a good tweet from, from Tom Harris-Smith, who occasionally writes for Tyler Stent on Twitter, who basically said that the teams who keep picking up points against us this year, it's the same teams, you know, Brentford, um, Stoke, Middlesbrough, have, have done pretty, Preston, I think, as well. Have, they've, it's maybe been a bit of a bogey team situation, which hopefully, you know, getting those teams out the way is a good idea um, for moving yeah. on then. Yeah. So, um, let's, hope, let's hope so. I mean, I think, again, the, the, the worst thing about it, well, I think everyone thinks the same, really. The worst thing about it was the results sort of really went for us again, didn't they? It was a, it was a good opportunity to get further away from your teams like Middlesbrough and Cardiff. I think Cardiff won, but keep, keep that gap there and it also to sort of push us up a bit higher into the playoffs. And the, the disappointment was not so much our result, it was the fact that all the results sort of seemed to go for us again and we didn't capitalise. And not only that, we've only got four points from the last 15 which uh, isn't good if you want to stay in the playoffs. No, absolutely. So the, that that comfortable gap that we've been talking about is is getting less comfortable, and certainly I think the games that we've got coming up are against some teams that are struggling down the bottom of the league, which ultimately has to be a chance for Reading to push clear. So we'll talk about that in a little bit with the Wigan game on Tuesday. Let's hear now from Velka Panovic of what he said after the Middlesbrough defeat. Not happy at all, but we can't... Uh start to be negative now. We have to remain uh, positive, we have to remain our guys uh, focused and uh, we have to absorb this loss and look at uh, the improvement we must have. I think the first half wasn't wasn't good. I think we didn't start emotionally well the game. The warm-up also didn't look good. So we tried to lift and uh, lift the guys and uh, address that. Um, but it continued. It, it just um, carried throughout the first 20, 20, 25 minutes um, and maybe throughout the whole first half. Uh, I think the, um, we, we had to make changes. We had to um, uh, bring uh, fresh legs also and, and guys who, who can help uh, from the bench. Uh, I think that worked. In the second half, we were, we were much more tighter, faster. We kept the good uh, ball movement and tempo. 
but um, we still we still didn't get the uh, the goal we were looking to score, which will definitely get them off our neck and and put us in a in a momentum that we were looking throughout the whole game to be at. But uh, it didn't happen. So now we have to just uh, turn the page. We have to we have to know that this is a marathon, and uh, setbacks like this uh, happen. Send in your views to the Tarnhurst End at gmail.com and have your say in the mailbag. Okay, let's do some mailbag then, Westy. Adam Jones kicking us off saying, are we missing that winger we wanted in the January transfer window? Just feels like we're missing a Mo Barrow, Jimmy Kerry type to terrify championship fullbacks. Perhaps Yaku Mate's return will be key. I think that you said earlier about, you know, Elisa Najari holding the ball a little bit too long. And I think that really when it comes, to, we've got a striker in Lucas Schau, who I think benefits so much from being hit early. Really, you play the ball into him as if you know it's he's thirty yards away from goal. There's there's only a couple of defenders around. It doesn't matter that he's thirty yards away from goal. He'll make that ground up, and that yeah. Mate doesn't necessarily deliver that early ball. And even you know a, a a pacey strike winger like a Barrow or Kebe, they tend to run to the byline and by you know by then quite often they lose the ball on the way. So perhaps it's not the the type of winger but just the mentality of the winger just to get that ball to Zhao as quickly as possible and just let him run a you know run a mock from there. There is there is a massive difference to when when Mate plays wide and when the other two do is if you if you've watched a lot of Mate's goals, he will he's much more direct. Um he's not always so interested in having the ball, but what he will do is a get beyond Zhao. He will get his legs and boat move and he will push into, push into central roles and he will get shots off. And I think they definitely need to mix it up. Um, I mean, we've had, obviously, Jari and Mate playing quite regularly when they're both doing fit. I think that mix it up quite nicely because it, with Mate, he's a different prospect and he definitely, we know he gets goals. Um, is he as good a footballer as them on the ball? Definitely not. But what he is, is, is a player that will drive towards goal and, and, and push defenders around because obviously they know that he's going to make them sort of runs whereas the other two will they can sit in front of them and watch them step over the ball four times and, and not go anywhere whereas Mate doesn't want the ball he wants to get in behind them he wants to get towards goal and he wants to score goals and I think they definitely need him back in the side sooner rather than later Well I suppose the, what I would say about Mate is that you know, talk about like Lucas Jao being marked out of the game. If your uh, team's set up against Reading, you don't really need to man mark Ajaria or Elise, but you probably do for Mate because he gets in the box and does that. And that does take the pressure off of Jao a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And he offers you different things than he Mate. Mate's decent in the air. He scores a lot of high headed goals. Um, like I say, he's, he's strong. He's a lot stronger than the other two. Um, so, yeah, you just need a bit of a mix. And I think also, not only that, when obviously Jao isn't 100%, he can play that role to a certain extent um, probably not as well as Joe don't get me wrong but he does offer you someone to hit um, so yeah they need him back I mean they need all the players that are not fit back let's face it and let's get that uh, squad nice and strong so it gives uh, Pavlovich options as well on the bench doesn't it we said he didn't change it effectively or hasn't done over the last couple of months but a lot of that is down to the fact that he's had no one really to, to stick off, stick on the pitch um, so they need everyone fit as soon as possible and to answer the question are we missing that type of winger? Then, yeah, I think we are. Um, we are missing a what I call a proper winger, rather than what I would say was two central midfielders playing playing wide or attacking midfielders. Yeah. Well, Sean Burge is saying, at what point does Moore come back in, and slash does Moore come back in? I think that what we've seen in the last few, you know, the last two or three weeks is that I think Liam Moore does have to come back in now. He was on the bench for the last couple of games. You probably, I think he played for the under 23s. I don't think his fitness is probably perfect yet, but really, I think for Wickham, you probably want to reunite that Moore Morrison partnership. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's, it's be hard to keep him out of the side now because you know, we've been scoring, we've been seeing a lot of goals um, in recent weeks. I think if you've got the club captains on the bench, the players that are on the pitch have got to play exceptionally well to keep him there for a long. Um, recently, they've been pretty decent, but in the last four or five results, we've conceded quite a few goals, haven't we? So it's difficult to leave him out of the side now, I would have thought. 
Yeah, definitely. Jack saying, should we change the system and start start Zhao and Puskas together? Um, or, you know, even Mato when he's fit, I suppose you could do that as a two up front. Funny enough, Westy, um, you know, completely pointless tangent, but my football manager team, I play a diamond with two strikers up front, usually Zhao and Mate. I've always thought that the diamond, given, you know, we're talking about lack of wingers and everything, it's... It's odd to me that that isn't a system that hasn't been tested. But you've got good wing backs, got good centre midfielders. I've always thought you kind of load up the places where you have your best players, and that we haven't done that, and that we are only playing one up front. It does kind of confuse me a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, especially in the next few games, it, it gives them an opportunity to maybe be a bit more forward thinking. Um, we've got, we know, we've got two good central midfielders in Rinomoto and Laurent and we know they can get around the pitch so do they particularly need to have another person in the midfield um, or what's that uh, having two sort of wide players um, you can still play three can't you you could you could push Elise in um, you could play go three five two if you wanted to like you say we've got wing backs that are set up to play as wing backs you could quite easily put Estevez back inside Yidham can do it and obviously Richards can do it on the other wing so I'd be surprised if he doesn't try that in the next couple of weeks, especially knowing the teams we've got, um, it's important for us to go in an attack size, I think, rather than sort of being pragmatic, because let's face it, we've been playing holding midfielders and we're still conceding goals, so would it affect us defensively? Maybe a little bit, but the fact is that if you attack a lot, then it's difficult for the other teams to score, isn't it? I just wonder, though, with Puskas and, uh, and Jao up front together, we've seen them play together before briefly in a couple of couple of occasions this this year and they they didn't seem to be working on the same wavelength neither of them were too close to one another um, I think Jao kind of a bit like Nicky Forster back in the day sort of as they're sort of selfish type players um, they can play up front on their own uh, whereas when they got a park now I think they sometimes struggle to um, get that partnership working so if you give it a try we'll soon find out but um, I think he would have to think about doing something a little bit different in the next coming weeks yeah, well, I suppose if the you know if the form doesn't turn around in the next seven days, we're almost looking at Plan B territory, aren't we? Because we have played that that four two three one basically all season, and certainly with Swift being out, having to you know shoehorn in Semedo or Rinomoto into that sort of more attacking central midfield role, it just feels like teams are uh, you know we've we've seen quite a lot of Reading teams in the past do well, get worked out, and then not have a Plan B, and you'd hate to see Paunovic kind of fall into the same trap. Yeah, the thing is, it's not a massive difference. If you think about the personnel, I mean, if you wanted to play three centre-backs and wing-backs, I mean, it's a good way of getting more back in the side without dropping back in side, because I don't think he entirely deserves it. I think he's been pretty good. Mm. Um, and the only, per- only person it means will be dropping out of the side is either Elise or Ajaria. And arguably, he doesn't always play Elise anyway, and Ajaria's form's not been great over the last few months, so I wouldn't have said. So if either of them two were sat on the bench, it wouldn't be so that much of a surprise, would it, to see just come in and push one of them more central because I think both of them the Jar and Elisa are better when they play in that role anyway more central they're more involved in the game um, they can have their two or three touches rather than get out from under their feet like I said earlier um, I just think it might suit Reading to just, just have a look at any of us so especially over the next two matches you would expect us just to get a bit more of a run in the side um, and you know he can use those goals and certainly that'll help yeah, definitely. Well, Arthur saying, what is going on with our home form? Feels like we've struggled at home now for years. I used to think it was to do with pressure from the fans and expectancy, etc. Um, obviously, that can't be the case now. Well, as I say, we've had seven defeats in the league this season, which is the fourth most. We've conceded 20 goals at home, which is the second most. Um, I've put already put forward my dressing room theory, but I suppose other than that, Westy, is it... It has been going on for a little while now, you know, a couple of years at least, and it feels to me that maybe it is that thing about you know other teams just aren't they don't they don't see going to Reading as a problem, and it is maybe maybe in normal times even it's just a little bit cosy. It is a little bit cosy, and like I said, I think I think we haven't when teams come to Reading, they come with a different plan. Than they will at home, and that's why we've been good away from home because it can catch teams on the break. Whereas you see Middlesbrough do it this week, I mean. Warnock knows us inside out. He's been playing against Reading for years and years. And he's always been a he's been a, a great championship manager, hasn't he? he? Always knows how to get a team out of the championship, or at least give them half a chance of getting out. And I think teams don't know how to play us at home, whereas the way they're, they're expected to sort of come on to us a bit more. Uh, and if we don't score the first goal, I think it's been difficult for us um, in many a game. And we've, I've said before when I've been on the show, we've not been out of any matches 
not really. We always look like we could either get back into it or we missed a penalty at a good time and end up losing the game. Uh, we missed good chances and end up losing the game. We've always been in them. But it's just getting that first goal, isn't it? I know it sort of blows out of the water against Brentford because we did get the first goal. But I just think if we don't score first, then teams can just sit in and watch us play pretty football in front of them and not really have to get out of second gear to stop us scoring. And let's face it, it's Jalsman been getting goals out of nowhere, hasn't he? And a lot of the games, he's scored some goals. You think there's no one on the pitch or even in the league that has scored a goal like that. And that is, it sort of marks over the fact sometimes that you haven't really created that many opportunities. Yeah, you can't really rely on a wonder goals or, or, you know, you can't always rely on set piece goals either. So that's probably something that Red need to think about. And um, final question then, if you want to get your questions into the Tyler Send podcast, we have the Twitter and the Facebook and also the Gmail, um, Tyler Send at gmail.com. Laura all saying, if you could pick one former Reading player and put in the current team, who would it be and why? Um, I think you know, we were talking about the winger argument earlier. I think a, a top form Bobby Convey or Stephen Hunt would be that sort of direct running. Maybe uh, Jimmy Kebe w- was brilliant when he got you know in that 2012 season when he got the crosses into the likes of Jason Roberts um, was brilliant. But I think for me, probably just a bit better. Certainly on the left flank that we don't have anyone left footed other than Sonny Luko who can can do that or at least say not really a winger. So I'll probably go for for a top form Bobby Convey myself to for, to fill that winger gap. I don't know about you, Westy. I answered it. I said I'd have Glenn Little. I'd have Glenn Little every day of the week because he's still and will always be, I think, the best winger I've ever seen at the club. And we've had some good ones down the years and I've been privileged enough to see Gilkey and, and, and Hunty and all the others that you mentioned. Um, but yeah, Glenn Little was just, he was different level. He not only done it in the Championship, when he had his season in the Premier League, he was still top level. And I think if he was in your side, then it's, your life's a lot easier. And it sort of defeats the object of saying the pace he ran, because he never had pace, but just <laughs> direct and skill and just ability to put a decent ball into the box was, well, second to none. And I haven't seen it before, and I don't think I'll see it again at least. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely, it's whether you would want to class it as like a bygone sort of type of player, but his, um, his abilities were, were so unique in terms of the sort of players that you see, because, you know, Bobby Convey, Stephen Hunt, relatively similar players on their day, but I can't think of anyone we've had, or just generally, not, there's not many players in football unless you want to sort of pick out a Ronaldinho sort of type who is similar to Glenn Little in the way that he, you know, played and everything. I'll tell you what, there's very few players, I mean, Shorey did it as well when he's at Reading, there's very few players that, that will demand the ball when things are going badly and take responsibility. And I think sometimes if you've got that player in your team, it, it, it sort of raises the level of everybody else. And um, I think Glenn Lewis should do that. There was one more question on Twitter, I don't know if you see, when someone said, if you had the choice, would you have Joe or Kitson um, fully, obviously, in the, at their peaks? And I said, I don't know if people agree with me, but I said Kitson. I think Sam Richards agrees with me, but he normally does. We don't often stray from the same point, me and him. Um, I said Kitson. The reason I picked Kitson is, one, he'd done it in the Championship, and two, he'd done it in the Premier League, and, and Jal was yet to prove that. Um, and I just think, all round, Kitson is a better player. Um, I know Jal was, well, you know, I'm a massive Jal fan. I think he's excellent on his day, but I think over a, sub- of, of, of a, of a long period of time, Kitson proved that he was a top-level striker. And I think he just offers you a little bit more than Jalbert, just a bit. Yeah, I think they're quite similar players as well, actually, in terms of you know their player. ability to hold on to the ball. They they both kind of have that. Certainly, Kitson had that ability to make his legs grow by about four inches and just poke balls out from where you didn't think he was going to be able to get to them, um, which was always you know fascinating to watch. But yeah, I probably I think I'd just about go Kitson as well. In, in terms of, I think he probably has the edge in the penalty box over Zhao. Maybe Zhao has a bit more yeah. pace, but yeah, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's certainly. Um, Not yeah, so no, that's a, that's a good question actually. If anyone wants to fire in more questions of the the old versus the new, it'd be fascinating to answer them because they're certainly you know with Reading actually doing right at the moment, you've got some tough questions there. Probably wasn't so tough asking us you know whether Lucas Piazon's as good as Bobby Convey because we could answer that in fifteen seconds. But these sort of ones, you know, Zhao versus Kits, and they are they are quite tough to answer. So certainly fire those like other, in. Sorry about like the other one. Is it would be uh, for the next question would be. Would it be the current two central midfielders against Super and Lapa? Uh, again, tough, tough question. But I think as long as thing is as long as that team, the immortal team, as you like to call them, really, is because 
they played in the Premier League, they did it in the Premier League and they've proved it, whereas the team we've got now I haven't proved anything yet, have I? Yeah, and I was tempted to go for Sidwell for the question on the old Reading player to introduce now, because I, th- I think he's the best player that you know, I've seen for Reading, and... The thing is, is that we have actually kind of got that box to box, you know, not as good, but Rinna Motta and Laurent can do a job in the Championship. And obviously, if we get to get into the Premier League, you might have to think about what you do with those two. But for now, I think we've got, you know, probably some of the, one of the best midfield combinations in the league at the moment. So, yeah, you can, it's, it's interesting how you can approach these questions, as I say. Do, uh, do send them in on the, the Twitter, Facebook and the email but we're going to go on now and talk about some news bites and see what's been going on around the club this week Be loud and be proud and back the boys and make some noise Come on you Oz! Shout out to this week's podcast sponsor ZCZ Films showing that age is no barrier to being a hooli hoop now, Westy, I don't know if you, um, you know, you might be absolutely sick to death of all things coronavirus, but there is some relatively good news coming out of the club um, this week. Or definitely, no, not relatively, this is just good news, um, coming out of the club this week, and that's the a vaccination centre being open at the Medeski Stadium this week. I think it's confirmed by the club today, but um, as obviously, they're, they're, I know for a fact they've been taking bookings for a week or so. My dad actually is popping down uh, this week, which is excellent news. Um, hopefully, I'll be interested in see how it all works and everything, but the Mad Stab being opened, I suppose, for for our point of view then, from the from the podcast, I think the question that I'd like to ask you is, where do you think, you know, in terms of fans returning to games and everything, this obviously being a sign towards that, what sort of, uh, what where can your optimism lie at the moment? I think it's done for this season, don't you? I think with 15 games left, I think we're pretty much, I think we're in the back end of this season of getting into the ground, uh, whether they bring back the sort of 2,000 uh, people in the next month or so, maybe. I think, especially, I think, I think you know what, the biggest problem they've got is, is the Euros. I think they're going to want to have crowds for the Euros. I mean, I think they want to have crowds now, don't be wrong, but I think just as a spectacle, it'd be odd not to have anyone in the stadiums for, for the international competitions, especially during the summer. So I think that's probably what they're aiming for more than, more than this season. It'd be lovely to think we'd get back in, sort of, even if it was for April. Um, can't they just put the um, centre by the turnstiles and just give you a jab as you walk in the ground? <laughs> can't do that happening. Um, yeah, I think, we're do- I think we're done for this season. I think you'd be lucky to see maybe two or three games at the back end of the season, if we're lucky. But I think the aim must be to get people in the grounds for the Euros. Yeah, no, that's certainly no. I think the Euros is probably if the problem is is because the Euros are so big that everything before that almost gets kind of put as the as not important and therefore ex, like expendable basically. And uh, you know, I, I think the the scenes that I was watching, I don't know if you saw the Super Bowl, Westy, but I was watching um, in where that, that was in Florida and they had basically a full stadium of people, and I was like, that's amazing. They've <laughs> they've beat coronavirus in America. I didn't realise they'd done that, and it's weird how you know we are. Uh, certain countries have certain different perspectives on it but we're obviously going to you know it looks like we're going to be taking our time on it and the i suppose the one thing that i mentioned on the podcast a few weeks ago there is that dream that i had of like a of you know 10,000 fans from either side being allowed to go into the playoff final and that feels logistically relatively sound given that it'd be may but i suppose that realistically maybe next season like the first weekend you might you know there might even be some away fans or something like that might have 10,000 fans 15,000 but that kind of feels like where we're heading at the moment yeah I still thought you know I'd, again I'd, my opinion is that I think if you're outside and you've all got masks on I don't really see where the issue is I can understand they don't want you buying beer or socialising too much and I know that when you go to get out of the ground so I went to the Birmingham game when you go to get out of the ground, you're still all on steps together. But as mm. long as you're masked and you're sensible, I think you're outside. I don't really see where the issue is. I really don't get it. I think you could have you could have put people in the ground for probably for March, April time. Like I said, what is it? Um, nearly two million people are in the, inoculated now. Um, sort of the people that are majorly at risk. I just I just think it's, it's maybe it's a bit overkill, um, especially yeah, being outside outside and people sort of mingling outside. I don't. I don't get it really, but hey, I don't make these rules and that's uh, probably a good job I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I do agree with you. I think it, this ultimately is as 
fans, I suppose we just have to be um, have to be patient. I think the problem is with in terms of general, you know, getting a bit onto a general point here, but generally governance and doing things to the benefit of football fans has not really been a thing, you know, for decades yeah. in this country. So football fans don't tend to be the ones who get the first, you know, the first jump. You know do you know what, Mark? The, the one thing I will mention about it is I, I think next season I'll be disappointed that I can't watch every game through my computer and then go back to the old, probably back to the old system because that has been great because I think, I mean, realistically, I've missed probably one game this year um, and I've managed to sit home and watch all the others, which has been quite nice. Um, especially when away from home, you, you're not going to go. It's been great to watch them on the, on the, on the box every, every weekend. Um, and that probably be lost again, which is which is quite a shame actually. If we're going to look at the sort of negatives of getting back into the world. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that personally, I think pay per view is going to make a big return in the Premier League, and they'll they'll keep they'll the three pm in the Premier League will go, but for the Championship, it will be you know the scheduling will stay the same. But yeah, it, whether we get into a system of kind of regional, I know in America that if you're you can't watch your region's game if you know Reading are at home, you can't watch it from a from a flat in Reading. But if Reading are at Middlesbrough, and the, there's you know we like to have this away fan culture and everything, but whether that's realistic in the future whether people are going to be so keen on it etc it's it's up in the air so yeah whether I'd, I'd certainly certainly for long distance away games I think they should definitely stay as the yeah, as a ten pound option like, yeah I agree with you I, like, even if it meant if even they said look if you go away from home because a lot of people like to go away from home and, and I mean I was one of them back in back in the day um, even if they said away fans are free you know, away fans are free just got to book your ticket online and then you can pay for it if you want to watch it through your through your computer screen because I think that'd be good for the clubs I mean it's got to be a better revenue maker than having 2,000 people turn up to your match or turn if you're at Middlesbrough and you've only got two, 300 turn up um, it'd be good for the away supporters because they wouldn't have to pay to get in and it'd be great for the people that then go in because they can sit and watch it yeah no absolutely certainly one of the things that we'll have to um, have to keep an eye on for the next next few months but as I say for th- in terms of fans return um, yeah nothing nothing too soon but hopefully you know there is that next season a bit more of a grand reopening just to catch you up then on what's been going on around the other teams of Reading this week the women next play on March the 7th against Bristol City they're currently 6th in the WSL um, ahead of this international break they're 4 points off 4th and 4 points ahead of seventh, so pretty comfortable there. Um, under 23s lost 3 0 to Leeds and lost 3 1 to Stoke in the week. Now, who Melvin Lambert scoring in that game as Moore and Puskas played? They next have Newcastle all week on Monday. And the under 18s beat Chelsea 2 1 on Saturday, came from behind with goals from Kelvin. And I'm really sorry that I'm going to get this wrong. Um, Kelvin Ehib. Ahibit uh, Hamon. I'm just not going to say that. Um, <laughs> goals from Kelvin E and Harvey Mordner. Yeah, sorry, Kelvin. Um, I should take the time to learn how to say that name, but I'm probably just going to get it wrong. So I'll just refer to as Kelvin E for now and Tottenham on the uh, agenda next week. So, Reading have a game on Tuesday night. Let's talk about that now in Big Match Preview. There's another huge game ahead for the Royals. So be loud and be proud for the Big Match Preview. So Tuesday 23rd of February 7.45pm as far as I'm aware it's on the Sky Sports red button and it's Wickham away and Westie when you go to the bottom side, bottom side in the league you have to win especially when you yourself are fifth and Reading you know one, Wickham have only won one of their last ten at home they've only won one of their last nine versus Reading um, if you can remember a 5-3 win for Wickham in October 1999 then please fill us in on your memories for that but otherwise, it's a game that Reading should really be winning. Yeah, they should be winning. If you, if you want to be taken seriously as a playoff team, then these are the games you must win. Um, again, we just hope they get their start fast and get in the lead. Because Wickham have been scoring recently, haven't they? They've, they've scored quite a few goals. They give Brentford a bit of a scare until they ended up getting fresh in the end. Um, so, it's, it's a game that the next two games, really, you've got to be looking to take six points from. Or four as an absolute minimum. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as, a, as a say, Wickham not on great run of form. Reading actually looking to keep their fourth away league clean sheet in a row for the first time since August 2011. So that'll be a bit of a feat doing that. And really, yeah, I think in terms of you know in terms of how Reading are going to approach this and selection and everything, I, you know, a potentially Liam Moore coming back in, I'd expect that. Maybe he might take Omar Richards out of the team. Um, Lewis Gibson, obviously, he's been a bit more involved and played left-back recently. 
otherwise, I really don't see a huge amount of change. I think realistically, Puskas isn't going to start. We're probably going to have, uh, you know, maybe he'll go to Sonia Luka, but then he's not really turned to Sonia Luka off the bench much. So the idea that he's going to come into the 11, I'm not sure about. Maybe Thomas Estevez will come back into right wing. But really, Westy, I think this is going to be the, the same sort of team that we've seen over the last uh, few weeks. Yeah, I think realistically it probably will be. Like I said, there's not a great deal of options for him to go to. Um, he, he might, he might, he might surprise us all and really freshen things up for this game and, and give a few a rest and put a few in that sort of been champing at the bit to get back in the side. Uh, any time will tell. Like I said, it'd be nice to see him take a risk and put two up front and, and play with wing backs because you've got the scope for that. You've got the players to do it. Um, I think if you look at the other fixtures in and around us, I think a lot of the teams at the top there are playing teams down the bottom. I know Brentford have got Sheffield Wednesday, um, Swansea have got Coventry. Um, I think the big game of the, the midweek is Bournemouth-Cardiff. I mean, that could really, really change things. If Cardiff were to get a result of Bournemouth, which wouldn't be a surprise at the moment, um, that would really change things in the playoff picture. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, I think it's key this week, this week uh, during the week, because there is games... Uh, that you'd expect the other teams to, to win in and around us. But as we've seen this year, who, who knows what might happen? Who'd have said that Liverpool would be six in the league? You just really can't, can't really, you can't guess it at the moment, can you? And I can tell you that from some of my uh, poor bets over the last couple of months. <laughs> well, uh, I'm a little aware. <laughs> well, I was going to, I was just about to bring in the prediction league, which might further emphasise that point. But what you, yeah, no, what, <laughs> what you're saying about, um, Middle, Middlesbrough have Cardiff on Saturday as well. So it re- I almost want Bournemouth to beat Cardiff just to, you know, yeah. it's the gap to seventh that matters. Whether we finish sixth or third, I think is immaterial, really. No, I think it'd be, it's more important as the teams that are at the top to keep winning because you don't want, you don't want them getting caught, do you? And then we worry about it in the playoffs if that's, if that's what ends up happening. Yeah, absolutely. Brentford Stoke also on, on Saturday might be worth uh, looking out for. But yeah, for this one, as I say, prediction league, uh, myself, Handbags and Ollie were the only ones to pick out a Bristol win. None of us got 2-0, however, and no one at all in the league said that we'd lose to Middles- Middlesbrough. So current standings, myself on 23 points, Handbags 22, Westy on 18, Ollie 16, Sim 14. So for Wickham, I'm going to say a 1-0 win. Um, it might be a bit more nervy than we'd like, but I think we'll get there in the end. What are you going to go for, Westy? I'm going to go for a two-one win because I think Wickham will score. Yeah, well, that is. I mean, we're both kind of going for a nervy kind of a kind of scenario, then, aren't we? Yeah, I just. Oh well, I take with two-nil up and they score in like the ninety-fourth minute. But if they're going to score, but um, yeah, just got to start fast, and you know Wickham's confidence is going to be low. And if you can get a goal in the first fifteen twenty minutes, you expect their heads to go down, and we should turn them over relatively easily. I hope. But like I said, you never know this year because anything could happen. And it's, it's around about this time of the season where the bottom clubs start getting results out of nowhere. And we just hope it's not this week. Yeah, absolutely. There, at some point, you know, there is that fight. It, it, really, at some point, maybe not for another five games, but you want to start playing mid-table teams at some point, the ones who haven't got anything to fight for, as we saw in, in playing Bristol City. So we'll see how it goes. Obviously, as I say, um, Tuesday night it is. On Saturday, we go to Rotherham. We'll be back after that um, for another episode of the Tilehurst and Podcast. Westy, thank you very much for joining us, and here's to what hopefully will be a pretty straightforward week. Yeah, fingers crossed on that one. And we will be back, as I say, after that Rotherham game. Reading, a bit of a stumble, having, having you know, we, we thought we might have been getting back on form with that Bristol City win, but a stumble against Middlesbrough. We will have two games against teams in the relegation zone coming up. So this is just that time of the season to, you know, get the performances and all this sort of stuff. And the, the fancy football starts to not matter now. It is just results that are going to keep Reading in the playoff places. And let's hopefully be talking in a week's time about two wins for the Royals and keep up to date with all that's going on on the Tireless Den Twitter and the website thank you very much for listening and come on you ours.
Peace, my